Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to the uh, Meet the Movie Director event uh, for MOG's uh, National Library Week celebration. Uh, we have with us tonight uh, Nick Geidner, who uh, has uh, directed and produced uh, numerous different um, things, but tonight we're primarily going to be talking to him um, about uh, the project, the library that Dolly built, and uh, some of his time at YSU as he was an uh, alumni um, from Youngstown State University. And uh, we're also going to talk a little bit about his work with student workers as well. So um, thank you for being here, Nick. Um, if you would like to, to introduce yourself a little bit, that would be wonderful. Oh, thank you, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm very excited to be back. Uh, I wish I could be there in Youngstown. I'm sure my mother who's watching along <laughs> which is uh, me and the kids and my wife could be back in Youngstown. Uh, but we are excited to, I'm very excited to talk to you. And uh, yeah, I went to Youngstown State. I got my bachelor's in telecommunications in 2005. And then I went to uh, Ball State University in Muncie, Indiana uh, and studied telecommunications. I got my master's degree from there, and then I came back to Ohio to Ohio State and got my PhD in mass communication uh, in 2011. And then uh, my first job out of uh, Ohio State was at University of Tennessee, and I've stayed there. I'm an associate professor in the School of uh, Journalism and Electronic Media, where I run land grant films, which is our documentary production program. And so that's a little little background on me. Well, thank you um, so much for being here. I did want to show uh, a clip um, from the uh, documentary, uh, The Library That Dolly Built. So let me just jump over here real quick. If something is yours, you're gonna take pride in it. things that I've done in my life, this is one of the most precious things. The idea behind the program is to gift a book each month from the day they're born until the month that they turn five. We just started this in my home county here in Sevier County, and we thought, well, maybe if we're lucky, it might go a couple of counties over. Working nine to five. currently have about 20,800 children in Knox County that are registered for Imagination Library. Every neighborhood I'm in, in D.C., families know about this program, grandparents know about this program. It is just uh, it's a game changer. If you're lucky and fortunate enough to be in a position to help, you should help. Are we proud of Dolly? The understatement of the year is yes. Are we grateful to her? Another understatement, yes. Do we expect more from her in the future? Absolutely. You better get to living, giving, don't forget. Dolly Parton is a symbol of how you can have a great combination of talent, worldwide recognition, but also give back and give to. When there's a word to the wise, you better get to living. The end. Ta da! <laughs> So that um, was the the one of the trailers. How many did you um, release? Uh, we just released one. It was just the one. Um, it's just there's a couple copies because if you notice that said April second and uh, our worldwide premiere was actually canceled because of uh, the pandemic. It was supposed to be April second last year and it was postponed. And so there's a couple trailers, but they're all the same trailer, just changing that end date as we. Uh, progressively pushed it back <laughs> oh life in the time of covid it must it must have made that whole process a little complicated for it sure. <laughs> yes um so i kind of wanted to ask you and i know that um you know the telecommunication students at ysu will probably be very interested um to uh hear about this but can you tell us a little bit about your time at youngstown state universities in the telecommunications department yeah and so 
I came to Youngstown State in uh, 1999. I graduated from high school from Austin Fitch. And um, really, I, I had no clue what I wanted to do. Um, I think I, I, I love photography and I think I knew I wanted to tell stories somehow. And I knew I wanted to do something important in my community and be involved in my community. And, uh, you know, I started out as a, a, in the fine arts program in photography and I wanted to be a photojournalist. And uh, back then, I don't know if it's still like that. You had to take the uh, fine art core, which is like drawing one and drawing two. And I got in, I, I faked my way through drawing one and then <laughs> drawing two, they said, we're gonna do a sketch from the masters each week. And I said, you are going to do a sketch for the Masters each week. I will not be. Um, and I, I left that, I, I left the fine art program and I really bounced around and I, I didn't do great. Um, I did really poorly, as a matter of fact, at Youngstown State at Parts. Um, but uh, I stumbled into the telecommunications program and found out that I could go to college for making TV, and that really changed my life. Um, I was able to to do things at Youngstown State to get my hands on video cameras and play around with things um, with uh, Professor Fred Owens. Uh, he was uh, my mentor there, and just um, the opportunities that I had there, and having someone support me and say you can do this this is a thing you can do uh really uh changed my life and uh i had some opportunities to do some things that were really big and ridiculous um, i worked with uh professor owens to uh create homework express which was a you know a nerdy call-in show for for kids for math and uh, science help not exactly the type of content you want to be creating as a <laughs> as a 22 year old, uh, but I got to do it and I got to work with a team and put together a project that went out into the world, and it was an amazing opportunity. Uh, along with that, through uh, working with uh, a couple friends of mine, I was able to start a uh, documentary it never went anywhere it wasn't very very good <laughs> um, but i got out and got in the field and was shooting uh filming with tim ryan the current congressman running for senator uh his first run for congress and i was able to go out in the field and shoot this stuff and play around and it was because i was i was supported by by youngstown state by the telecommunications program i told uh, Fred or Jim Stipetich, uh what I wanted to do with the cameras. I want to follow Tim around on election day. And they were like, no problem. And they gave me cameras and they let me do things. And uh, that ultimately led me to where I am today. Um, and so Youngstown State was, uh, you know, a bumpy ride, but it was transformative. And I owe everything that I have to the the support of my professors there. Gosh, that's wonderful. So it goes to show that even if you don't necessarily find, you know, pick that that uh, initial program, you know, you, you can still find something that you're really, really passionate about and that you can make a wonderful career out of. And I think that that really shows a lot um, about the, the faculty experience that you had and the mentorship. And I think sometimes people forget, um, you know, they think of faculty as just kind of being the people that are giving them work. And, you know, these are just classes they have to do until they get out into uh, the world, into their careers. And they can be so much more than that if you look to them for that kind of guidance. And I think that is uh, is the important thing. You need to I mean, we're at, I'm now faculty. Uh, we're busy and we got a lot of things going on, uh, but we want to help. And, you know, we'll try to help as much as we can through classes and through, you know, places hours. to contact you. But yeah. if you want something, come to your professor's office. If you want to do something tied to your degree, tied to your program, professors want to support you. They want to help you and they want to give you access to equipment, access to labs, whatever, whatever discipline you're in. 
Yeah, that's something, you know, you would have to go and talk to the students in the health and human services department. Every single time I see them, I'm like, you guys, I'm here for you. Like, I want you to succeed. Like, all you have to do is ask me for help and I will happily give it to you. And, you know, I think that that's sometimes hard for people to do is ask for help and ask for for more assistance. And, you know, what's really important, I think, for all students to realize is you have an entire university that's, you know, full of people that just want you to succeed, you know. Um, so that's that's a beautiful message, I think, especially to to uh, you know explain to students. Um, you did mention about Homework Express. Um, how did that impact the the documentaries that you worked on then, and, and the the doctor the documentaries that you're working on now, like um, the library that Dolly built? Um, for a handful of years, uh, as part of UT's summer orientation, uh, I was part of it. Um, they had me speak to parents and, you know, say nice things about UT. Um, but, you know, the, the message that I said there was that when I came to undergrad, I had an opportunity to create something big, something that's still on my resume today. And in my faculty position, as a, as a professor at the University of Tennessee, that's what I want to do. I want to create projects that are lasting. I want to create things, experiences, educational experiences that live with students for the rest of their careers. And, and I can't think of a better example than the library that Tully built uh, in that I had uh, myself and Clint Elmore, uh, my, my partner in crime, who is uh, the video production uh, specialist for the college, we were the only two professional crew, uh, if you can call us professionals, <laughs> <laughs> we were the only two professional crew on the film. Every other person, except for some, some small like post-production stuff like final sound mix and stuff like that, other than that, Every crew member is a student, uh, ranging from freshmen to uh, graduate students. And all of the, the work that I've done through land grant is really just trying to create big projects that students can get involved with and take with them and see that you can do good things, big things in your community if you care. Oh my gosh, that's a, such a beautiful sentiment. Um, you did mention uh, land grant films. Could you just discuss a little bit more about land grant films and and kind of what that is? Yeah. So uh, I I actually and here's another lesson. This is like a second career for me within my career. I actually started at UT as a more of a, a research faculty member. I, I taught uh, quantitative methods in our PhD program, and then I sort of transitioned into this creative work. Um, and it was all sort of because of my students. Uh, about six years ago, we had the opportunity to do a bunch of video storytelling tied to um, the Medal of Honor convention. The Medal of Honor is the, the highest military medal. Um, and the living Medal of Honor recipients were coming to Knoxville. And I happened to have the, the chance to get my students in to do a lot of in-depth reporting with these men. And uh, that turned into a, a pretty big thing. Uh, we ended up making an hour long, uh, like event focused, event coverage focused documentary uh, about the Medal of Honor convention that aired on our local NBC affiliate. And we got done with that and we had all this equipment. Um, we had students interested in this type of long form storytelling. And so we were trying to figure out what we do with all this because the Medal of Honor convention was gone. Um, and so we had the opportunity to work with a, a phenomenal organization called Project Healing Waters. And they're an organization that takes and teaches wounded veterans fly fishing. And me and some students went out over fall break and covered their two day trout fishing tournament where they uh, took 12 wounded veterans out into boats and went fishing. And we created a 12 minute documentary and it was, it's Teach a Man to Fish. You can find it on uh, landgrantfilms.org. And it was a great experience for, for my students. It ended up going to a couple of film festivals, won some awards, did well. But then I, I heard from Project Healing Waters uh, later and they used that film to raise thousands and thousands of dollars for their organization. Wow. 
And so uh, that's when it sort of clicked that this can all work together. And so land grant films, uh, UT is a land grant university like Ohio State and Ohio, where uh, part of our mission is to be involved and give back to the state. And so I think generally that is applied to like the ag campus part of the university. But I personally thought that every part of the university should be involved in the land grant mission. And so journalism and storytelling and media creation, we can be involved by working with community partners to tell stories and share uh, the work being done in the community. And some of these stories are fantastic, uplifting things like our, uh, our work with Project Healing Waters, but we've also uh, dove into problems in our community. We did a documentary about uh, neonatal abstinence syndrome or drug uh, opiate dependent uh, babies, babies born opiate dependent. And, you know, that was much uh, a much harder uh, news story type of documentary. Uh, but it featured some amazing people in our community doing great work that's being recognized nationally to uh, try to help these children. And so uh, land grant just sort of flowed out of that as a way to organize this and give back. Wow. Okay. Um, so land grant was uh, also part of the documentary of um, the library that Dolly built. Um, I just had a my own personal, um, and I'm sure everybody else's was why this, like why this story of all of the stories that you could tell, and there's so many things to do documentaries on. Um, why did Imagination Library um, become, you know, a passion project? For you? Um, you know, I when I interviewed at Tennessee, um, that was the first time I'd ever been in Knoxville. Um, and the woman giving me a tour was driving me around campus and showing me the sites. And she said, oh, and by the way, we've given out some honorary degrees. We recently gave one to Dolly Parton. And I went, oh, how, how Tennessee of you to give an honorary <laughs> degree to uh, Dolly Parton. And I just sort of laughed. And she was like, no. And she uh, explained uh, the the amazingness of Dolly Parton and the the signature, the selling point was about the Imagination Library. And uh, I just fell in love with the program from then. Uh, you know, it's such a simple and amazing program uh, that I just, I love the idea of it. Um, and then we had our, our first son, we now have two, but we had Henry and he started getting the books and, you know, I'm, I'm a college professor. Of course, we're going to have tons and tons of books uh, for our kid, but um, those books were different and they were special and they were unique. And it was such a well put together collection that um, I, it really became an emotional thing when we were getting closer and closer to uh February of when he turned five and was going to end the program and graduate out of the program. And so I wanted to do something for the Imagination Library to, to thank them and to celebrate them because they, uh, they do amazing work. And it is a backyard story. Uh, the Dollywood Foundation, which is, is who organizes the Imagination Library, is about 40 minutes from my house to, to there. Um, and so this was a, a natural kind of story for us. Um, and I happened to be, I was doing some research trying to figure out how I could pitch this. And I happened to notice, I, I did the math and figured out that they'd be giving out the 100 millionth book the same month my son graduated out of the program. And so that was the original pitch was uh, to follow that hundred millionth book and sort of, you know, the the delivery, the dedication of the hundred millionth book, uh, which you see in the film, it's at the, the Library of Congress, which was an awesome experience. Um, but the film just started growing more and more from there. Um, we really, when we started this, uh, we were picturing like, you know, an hour, like a TV hour, like 42 minute kind of thing for, you know, distribution across the state. We thought the, the statewide PBS would be interested. Um, and it just kept growing and growing from there because um, 
everyone that we asked to do anything for the film from the Grand Old Opry to Danica McKellar to anyone uh, said yes immediately because the program is just so fantastic. That's amazing. Um, just because you mentioned her, how did you get Winnie Cooper to sign on to this? Which, you know, for any of you kids who don't know, that's Danica McKellar, who will forever be to me Winnie Cooper from the Wonder Years. Uh, she is uh, Elsie Snuffin from West Wing to me. Uh, <laughs> oh, yes. I also know her as Winnie Cooper, but I, I love the West Wing, and so I'm going to go with Elsie Snuffin. Uh, but, uh, you know, Danica is not just uh, a successful actress, but she's also an author. Um, she does a whole series of math books, um, and one of them is a children's book called Goodnight Numbers, and it is a book that's in the Imagination Library collection. And so um, David Dotson, the, the CEO of the Imagination Library or of the Dollywood Foundation reached out and said, hey, we're doing this thing. Would you be at all interested? And she said, yes, of course, amazing. I can actually do it in like two weeks. And I mean, it was, it was ridiculous. Um, uh, and it worked out because I was gonna be in Vegas anyway right then, so I actually, drove from Vegas over to LA and met me and David and her met at a recording studio in LA like two weeks after we approached her. Um, oh my gosh, that was like serendipitous. Yeah, it went, in, it was very perfect and she was awesome and she's an amazing person to work with, it was really nice and uh, really helped. Um, she's a professional voice actress. She doesn't just do the acting, she's also done voice work for cartoons. And so she was just, I mean, a, a amazing professional. Like I'd say, well, I'm, I'm playing this off a line that's a little bit, this read, this should read a little jokey. And she just do little things with her voice that made it completely different feel. It was amazing. Um, but then we also had the um, serendipity of Dolly was in LA for something then too. And so Dolly was able to stop by the studio and surprise Danica. And that was the first time Danica had met Dolly. And so it was a, it was a great little moment to, uh, to see. And uh, my claim to fame in that is that <clears throat> when Dolly came into the studio, uh, David Dotson, who's known her for years and runs the, the Dollywood Foundation, was like, oh, and this is, remember, this is Nick Geidner. He's the director. And she was like, oh, I know Nick. And so for the rest of my life, I'm just going to claim that I'm an acquaintance of Dolly Parton. <laughs> That's awesome. Is she like as sweet as she seems? I mean, I know she has to be, but she's just, she is a national treasure. She is uh, a different world. Um, the first time we interviewed her was at the uh, Library Congress. Um, you know, she had a thing the night before, and then there was stuff before the event and then there's the whole event and then she did uh, a bunch of national media and then we were the last interview so we could have a little bit more time with her and i mean she's 72 i mean she was 72 at the time and she did all this stuff and was still bright and chipper and excited and she would have talked to us uh for hours if her handlers weren't like we need to go to the next thing like I mean, she was fantastic. I mean, and she uh, was, has been very supportive of the film from the beginning and was willing to do it um, in part because it was uh, UT students getting to getting to do this. She loved that part of our pitch. Yeah, it's it was amazing. Um, it was and I, I, we kind of talked about this before for um, but as a librarian, I think one of the most beautiful things about this film was the emphasis that she had on, you know, illiteracy and wanting to improve literacy for children and how to be involved in that. And that was one of the, the early philanthropic things that she took up period. I mean, she does a lot of, of um, different work in that department, but children's literacy was such a huge aspect of of her from the get-go um, because of, of her father's um, illiteracy. So uh, as a librarian, it's just one of the most beautiful things. Anytime that I think we put um, more of a conversation on children's literacy and um, 
education and getting children with a hand in their book as early as possible. Um, I think that's always such a beautiful thing. And the fact that she did that without, you know, without any, any real push, like this was her idea. She just wanted to, to do it on her own. I think is, is a real testament to who she is. And I, I just loved getting to research this um, and figure out how it happened. I mean, I think there's some things in the film that, you know, really have never been discussed before because the imagination library is a little bit is an odd duck when it comes to uh, a charity because it's a huge national charity, but at the national level, it doesn't need to raise any money. Um, all the money comes from the, the Dolly universe at the national level. And like I, like we cover in the film that covers the cost of the, the national administration. They deal with all the contracts with Penguin. Um, they deal with the database of all the kids' names, like the one point, I think it's 1.8 million names now. Uh, they deal with all that. And that all just comes from Dolly. Uh, and so they don't need to raise money in the same way that most organizations have to. And because of that, they really haven't told their story before. And so it was awesome getting to talk to, uh, you know, these people that have been around for 25 years, but haven't really explained how this thing actually started. There's sort of the, the generic Dollyism of, oh, I started this because my dad couldn't, because my dad was illiterate. And yeah, that's definitely why she started it. But that's not how she started it. And I think that's what we were really proud to do in this film is try to dig into how this actually started, because like everything Dolly, she makes it look simple and she plays it down like it's easy. But this was a lot of work and a lot of thought. And this isn't just a program where Dolly picks a couple books and sends them to kids. This is a program that takes literacy and the, the nature of children's literature into account in creating a comprehensive 60 book set. And so I think that's what, uh, I, I hope that's what people, the, the Dolly part of the story that I hope people take away from this is that although she acts like this is just, oh, I just did this. This was a ton of work, a ton of thought, a ton of effort by numerous people led by the greatest, one of the greatest performers in the world. This is ridiculous. And uh, I, I think she deserves more acknowledgement for that than she even gets. Yeah. yeah. Well, I know um, even in Ohio, it's available. Imagination Library is available in all 88 counties now. And it's available in the UK and the Republic of Ireland and Australia and um, England as well. Like it's it's providing books internationally now too. So you have to feel like that has to be a, a lot of work for all of those people. They definitely deserve a lot more credit, like you said, than, than they're probably getting access. And I didn't really know about the Imagination Library until very recently. Um, and I'm glad that you kind of put this together because it is like its own marketing tool. It's a way for them, you know, we're going to be sharing it um, uh, through this and um, through our page. Uh, but I know that you, you know, it's available on YouTube for free. Like anybody can go watch it, um, which is amazing as well. So uh, any kind of marketing, I think is always going to be good for them because the best thing that, you know, we can ever do is get more books into the hands of children. And it is, I mean, it, it's like I say in the film, or like I guess Danica says uh, in the film, uh, this is uh, Dolly Parton's Imagination Library is one of the biggest purchasers of children's books in the country. Um, their, their only rivals uh, are people like Walmart and Amazon. Um, there's just nobody that compares. And, I, I, and we couldn't fit it into the film um, because it just didn't, didn't work. Uh, but one of the most fascinating things, uh, we asked David Dotson, the head of the uh, Imagination Library, um, when they were creating their 10-year plan, he talks about the 10-year plan, but we asked, like, when you were creating your 10-year plan, like, at a university, we look at peer institutions, like, you know, University of Florida is a peer institution in Tennessee. So we compare ourselves to them. And so I was like, well, who do you compare yourself to like when you're building this 10-year plan? And 
he was like, you know, that was a real problem. There is literally no one for us to compare ourselves to except for government programs like Head Start and WIC. Oh, I mean, these are billion dollar programs that he's comparing himself to. And I'm talking to him in this 1700 square foot little blue house uh, in Sevier County. Um, and it was just, it was mind boggling for me to think of that's all that they can compare themselves to at this point. I mean, their goal, and we say in the film, their goal, and they're going to hit it within their 10-year plan, is to get into 10% of homes in the United States. And that's mind-boggling to me. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, so I do want to go um, into the actual documentary a little bit. Um, so I do have a couple clips that I, I want to show, um, but I did kind of want to talk to you because we have uh, discussed a little bit previously about um, the students input um, in land grant films and how you kind of always made that um, a big selling point um, in their careers that students make things in, in their program so that they can take those out in, into the world and, and put those on their, their CV or their, um, their resume. Um, and in, in the documentary, um, there were two sections that, um, we previously discussed about student involvement. And the one was about the, the DC, um, Minnesota, um, section of, of the documentary. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? And then I'll, I'll show a quick little clip of that too. Yeah. I mean, I, I think one of the things that we really wanted to show, um, is, uh, how this program is applicable everywhere um, and that it is being used everywhere. And so um, we had Washington, D.C. because we shot the uh, uh, Library of Congress stuff out there and we talked to some people out there. So we had the, the D.C., which represents big urban. And so we wanted something else and we were looking for some places in, in East Tennessee, in rural East Tennessee to highlight. Um, and we do another one in, in a parade scene, but that's, but we wanted somewhere that was really small. And so we were out in uh, Minnesota. We were going to go to Minnesota to interview Nancy Carlson, the author of the, the, uh, uh, I'm blanking on the name. Uh, oh my gosh. The kindergarten book. Kindergarten, uh, here I come. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I blanked on the <laughs> kindergarten. Here I come. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and we were out there and uh, we were, we had an extra day to kill um, because of flights and costs and stuff like that. And so I just put out a Facebook message and was like, did some, a little bit of targeted advertising. I think I spent a whole, a whopping $10 in uh, Facebook advertising and said, Hey, is there anybody involved in the imagination library that, that wants to talk? Um, and uh, John Gilbo reached out to us and it was just complete serendipity uh, of him having the the perfect story that we needed and just being a great guy and uh, running an amazing, important program. And so, yeah, that was that. Okay, let me bounce to that really quickly. Policy initiatives and simple word of mouth connections, new diverse communities are joining the Imagination Library all the time. DC Public Library is a 26 uh, branch campus. We have got uh, 700,000 people in, in the district and about 400 to 425,000 registered cardholders. I've known about the Imagination Library for years, uh, but um, uh, a local council member here in uh, D.C., Charles Allen, uh, was the real, um, I think, uh, sort of instigator for bringing the program to D.C. My brother and his family happened to live in Johnson City, Tennessee, and our kids are the same age. We went down to go visit, and while I was there, as luck would have it, uh, the mail got delivered, and my niece was so excited, ran to the mailbox, and there was this book for her. It had her name on it. And I asked my, my brother and sister-in-law, where did this come from? And they said they signed up when their daughter was born at the hospital. And then they said, Dolly sends it. 
and you're in southern Minnesota, we're roughly two and a half hours from the Twin Cities. Uh, there's 369 roughly people here, and I say roughly because you know people come, people go. Um, some background on our community educationally is we had a little degree until the early 2000s, sponsored by the County Library Association, and then when that pulled out of Ceylon, it really left a void here that we were never able to fill. And that seems crazy in today's world. Who doesn't have access to books will come to a place like Ceylon. There's no libraries here, there's no stores here. I uh, kind of we use the term educational desert. I was on Facebook and a friend had their child enrolled in the education library over by Albert Lee, Minnesota. I sent her right away and I said, geez, I said, this looks amazing. How did you do this? And she said, well, um, here's the website, go there. I looked in the program and learned all about the Imagination Library and the great work of Dolly Parton. And I decided to bring that program back to DC. And we now have every kid in DC from age zero to five as a part of the Imagination Library. We have eight total children in the program. Um, and I know people probably will say, please, you come from Knox or wherever, and it, there's a huge group. Uh, you know, our group's been around for three, four months, and our goal uh, with the nonprofit is at least 200 kids in three years. I mean, that's where, where we want to be. Will we end up there? Maybe not, but if we hit 100, I think any more we add is a success. Every neighborhood I'm in in D.C., uh, families know about this program grandparents know about this program, it is just uh, it's a game changer and it's really exciting. We have um, 34,000 kids that are receiving books now, over 430,000 books that have been delivered, all in, in just two years. It's really, I get kind of emotional because for us it matters. I'm sorry, I mean it matters to us. What we This is something we need here because without it, there's kids that aren't going to get books. The goodwill that it has uh, developed for the library has been um, astronomical. I think you're muted. Sorry about that. Um, I don't know about you guys, uh, but when I watched that, like it brought a tear to my eye. Like the the fact that um, he was so emotional about those, you know, eight children having access to books. It was just, you know, like I said, I'm going to keep going back to that. But as a librarian, like that did me in. <laughs> it was gorgeous. Such a beautiful, beautiful part. Um, there, I would like to ask you now, um, we're getting close to um, the 645 mark, and I did want to do kind of a, a question answer option for students. Um, I will put another um, clip on our Facebook about the accessibility part, because that is another um, aspect of this documentary that was so beautiful um, about children um, for audiobooks and braille, so children who have um visual or hearing um impairments or disabilities and um it was that part is something that you know i didn't necessarily think about as somebody who doesn't know about that aspect of of getting braille books made or or um the the necessity of audiobooks in in quite the the frame of mind that they that you know um imagination library has has thought about it um so i will put that in because i do think it's such a beautiful part of part of it that i do want people to to see that if they don't watch the whole thing which i obviously really recommend that too um but if they just want to look at a couple different um aspects of it i'm, I'm going to put that link in there as well um but I wanted to ask you some of your best advice. Um, what can you tell students uh, uh, that are interested in, in um, documentary filmmaking? Um, you know, I think the, the most important thing is just being curious. Um, you know, the, the cameras, the, the editing, uh, those are things that can be learned. Um, being curious is just uh, a, I don't know. It's just a, a part of who you are, and it just needs to be something that you uh, try to engage in and asking people uh, what's going on. I mean, that's really the base of all the, most of these films that I do is uh, what's going on here? How can I explain this? What do people not understand about this thing? And I try to take it the same no matter who I'm interviewing. Um, or what story I'm telling. It's all about uh, trying to understand 
why this thing is happening or why this person did what they did. And it's no difference. It's no different whether I'm interviewing Dolly Parton and asking her why of all the things in the world did you choose this? Or if I'm interviewing uh, the main character in our NAS, our neonatal abstinence syndrome documentary, if we're interviewing her about how she gave birth to one dr drug dependent baby and went out and gave birth to another drug dependent baby. I don't understand that. That doesn't make sense to me. And so I'm trying to understand that. And I don't know why Dolly, uh, she's a hundred millionaire. I, like, I don't know why she's spending her time on this. She, she could do anything that she wants. I don't, I don't understand why she's so overly dedicated and devoted to this. And so I wanted to understand. And I think it's just curiosity, curiosity for your, your fellow people, for people in your community, trying to understand uh, and not judging, just trying to understand people for who they are. Okay, um, we are going to open it up now to questions. If anybody um, on Facebook has any questions um, for Nick, please um, send them in. Um, while we're waiting for those questions to come in, I had one just for myself. Um, has the documentary kind of changed? There, there was that one section of the documentary where they were talking. Um, it was a public library in Tennessee about how as soon as the children graduate from the program at five, um, the public library sends them an invitation to come and, um, you know, get their own library card. Um, has this documentary changed your relationship with libraries in any way or the, the process that goes into libraries? Because we love libraries to begin <laughs> with. We love our library. Um, you know, a big reason why we did this is we love uh, our library. Our library runs our imagination library. Um, in Mahoning County in Youngstown, uh, the Imagination Library is run by the United Way, which is also awesome. And in many communities, it's like that. In ours, it's our local library, and our local library is about a mile from here. And, you know, we, Henry spent a lot of time there. Uh, Sam, unfortunately, hasn't spent as much because of the pandemic, but mm -hmm. we are very much looking forward to getting back to story time. We love our libraries. Uh, we will do anything we can to support them. So it hasn't changed it at all. Um, <laughs> but that is Henry's library card that you see in that scene. Uh, that's Henry's library card. He was very excited to get it. Uh, we took a picture and then uh, our communic the communications person for our local library saw it on Twitter and was like, hey, can we use that? And now there's a big, like, almost life-size photo of Henry with his card down at the public library in downtown Knoxville. So that's that's fun. Oh, that's awesome. Um, we do have a question um, from Terry Benton. Uh, it's how did your students react to being involved in the project? And have they thought much about childhood literacy before? Um, I would say not not much to the second to the second question. I, I, I don't think they had thought uh, intensely about children's literacy, but most of them are young enough and Tennessee, the nature of the University of Tennessee, most of my students are from Tennessee. Most of them had gotten the books when they were young. And so they were sort of familiar with the imagination, imagination library in that regard. And um, they all knew about it. Um, the imagination library here is a lot different than it is there. People are just discovering the imagination library in, in Ohio, in Knox County. Uh, 80 to 85% of kids get the Imagination Library books. Um, and so wow. it's very much a, a different thing here. And so, uh, but more than anything, uh, my students love Dolly. Um, they're they are very much acculturated in the, uh, <laughs> in the Dolly world. And so they were over the moon uh, to get to do anything to uh, honor her and be be part of telling her story. And so, yeah, um, yeah. Okay, um, we have another question. Um, how do you manage a full movie production schedule with student staff who might have challenges that full-timers don't, like for instance, spring break? Uh, it's a mess. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
you know, documentaries, as much as they are a huge team sport, um, I think there's 30 some people credited on this film. There's really a small group that is really involved in a lot of the stuff from editing and writing and research and producing. And so as much as I'm managing for this film, a huge crew of 30, really on a day-to-day -day basis, it was like four or five students that I was really working with. And, you know, honestly, it, it doesn't work all that well. Um, I, I don't think, I, I'm so happy that I did it. I'm so happy for my students that they were able to be part of it. Um, but a feature doesn't really work for the model that I want to do. And so with really engaging students, uh, so future things that I'm doing are more in shorter episodic kind of things. So we're working on a, a documentary on education in the state of Tennessee, and it's going to be a three episode series pitched to the local PBS affiliate where a student, a set of students can be involved in one part and then bail out if they need to, and then be involved in episode three if they want to. Um, and so that's how I'm working it. Uh, I'm also really lucky. We have a, a master's program, a graduate program at UT. And so I have some students that I have a, a graduate assistant for land grant. And so we have some students that we can, we can fund and that helps, you know, have a base of workers. Okay. Um, one other question I have for me um, is when the students were, were kind of getting involved in this whole process, because I'm a research librarian, um, were they kind of astounded by how much research actually went in and how much time was actually spent doing the actual research for the documentary? Yeah, I think that's the biggest misperception that students have about documentary um, and, and people have about documentary. I think a lot of there's the perception that you just go out and shoot and then come back into the edit room and make a movie. And it's not like that at all. Um, it involves a ton of research. Um, we spent, I mean, me and Abby Bauer, the, the writer um, and lead student producer, I mean, I think we've literally watched every clip of Dolly uh, that's on YouTube. Um, we've listened to everything that she said, we read, you know, a, a couple books of collections of all of her different interviews from newspapers and magazines. Uh, we called through the history of the Knoxville News Sentinel and the Sevierville Mountain Press, looking for everything that we could find. Um, and then we conducted 20-some uh, interviews for this film. Wow. It's, it's, a, it's a ton of research. Yeah, I, I I think that's a, a huge misconception about just research period anymore is that it takes a really, really long time. I have students come to me all the time and they say like, oh, you know, my papers due next week and I figured I'd just do a little research and then the longest part would be writing the paper. And I'm like, no, y'all, like that's the writing of the paper should not take as much time as actually all of the, the research that kind of goes into it. And um you know, I would assume that with a documentary, it would take a lot of time, especially when you're doing something that that spans 20, 20 years, really, because this was started in 1992. It's 25 years this year. Oh, 25 yeah. years. So, yeah, that's a lot of stuff to go over. And especially when you're dealing with somebody who's been, you know, um, a performer since the 70s, like that is a long period of time of, of different things to go through. So that totally makes sense to me. And it paid off. I mean, we found some really cool things. Um, at one point in the film, uh, we show footage that we got from our local NBC affiliate. who was really uh, amazing and let us use a lot of footage for free. Um, we found footage and it was just labeled in their archives as early Dolly performance. And because we dug through the, the archives at the Sevierville Mountain Press, the local paper where in the, the town that she grew up, we were able to, um, literally two of my students were digging through the attic of the Sevierville Mountain Press. They said, yeah, you can do whatever, just, yeah, whatever. And so they're digging through the attic, finding bound copies from the, the 60s and 70s. And we were able to find that the, the footage that we had from WBIR was actually her first philanthropic concert. It was the first concert that she did to uh, give back money to the Sevier County Marching Band. 
And so we were able to put that together and, and nobody knew that. And that was because of that research. And so I think there's a lot of little things like that in the film that, you know, the viewer might not even know, but it, it was research, um, you know, for, uh, you know, its whole history. Uh, the Imagination Library has been saying the wrong number of books were their first shipment. They were always saying our first shipment was 2100 books or I think they were saying their first shipment was 1600 books, but we were able to find the original uh, packing slip basically. And that's mm -hmm. in the film and it's you add it up and it's 2100 books. And so, you know, does that really matter in the whole scheme of things? No, but it's cool. And I'm, I'm glad we found it and I'm glad, you know, that, that that's there. Yeah. I mean, you know, when you're, when you're talking about facts, you might as well have them, right? It's good, always good to have accurate numbers. And I think for yeah. them too, like they were, they were, you know, kind of lowballing themselves a little bit, like give yourself credit. That's 2,100 books. Like, you know, that's significantly more when you're talking about, you know, the amount that they thought they were sending out. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of amazing too. Um, so what I'm hearing here is really use librarians and the libraries that you have access to and really you know don't be afraid to kind of go into those those primary resources especially when you're you're doing a lot of documentary um, research yeah and we have uh, our library also has tamas which is the uh, tennessee archive of moving images and sounds and they were amazing too there's a, a clip that you see in the film of dolly singing uh she's really young like 15, 16 years old. And that's that's the first time that clip's been aired in full um, like that. Uh, it was found in a, a woman's, uh, a woman that passed away in a shoebox. And it was archived by uh, Tamis. And we reached out to her daughter and said, is there any way we can use that in our film? And she was like, yes, of course, my mother would be so over the moon. And so we were able to put that in and uh, they they screened it once at a local event, but that was really the first time that that's been shown nationally. And that's a, an early piece of Dolly uh, footage. Wow, that's amazing. Well, so oh, I'm sorry. So libraries, awesome. <laughs> yes, well, you know, we take what, you know, any kudos we can get, we always love that. Um, you know, we're getting up to the seven o'clock hour. Nick, I cannot thank you enough for spending an hour with us. Um, you know, coming back to Youngstown State, you know, virtually, but um, coming back and and uh, giving us an opportunity to talk to you and and um, hopefully be able to impart some wisdom on our students. I know that this is invaluable to them, and um, I do know that there were. Um, there were faculty from the telecommunications department that was really interested in, in being able to to be a part of this as well. Um, so I know that they're, they're really appreciative to you and we really just, you know, are so thankful for this. And it was such a beautiful tie in with it being during National Library Week and the celebration of of libraries and children's literacy and and everything that, you know, we as librarians try to do and, you know, um, getting the celebration of, of literacy and, and libraries out um, nationally. So thank you so much um, for for being a part of this. Uh, we can't thank you enough and, you know, keep on doing that. That wonderful work and you know the next time you're in town visiting your family like we'd love it if uh you know we could we could buy you lunch <laughs> so please let us know when you're in town we would love to to get to um you know walk you around mog and you know have you visit the university and maybe get together with some of your old mentors as well Fantastic. Well, thank you very much to have for having me and any of the students. If there's any way that I can help, feel free to reach out. Uh, I'm on Twitter uh, at N Geidner, N G E I D N E R. Um, my brother is also a YSU alum and a relatively successful journalist. Um, he's <laughs> actually a very successful journalist. <laughs> Just wanted to be modest, I guess. Um, <laughs> Because you know he's my older brother, and so I'm I'm better than him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a yeah, sibling he's rivalry. A very accomplished uh, journalist, and uh, he works for an advocacy organization in Washington D.C. 
and is also a Youngstown State alum. Um, and there's a lot of us out there. Um, and so reach out if, you, if you're a student. Uh, find out who we are, reach out to us. We're more than willing to help. Um, and uh, if you're an undergrad and you're looking to go somewhere for a graduate program, we have a master's program down here at Tennessee. So reach out and uh, yeah, we'd love to get you involved in our films. All right, thank you so much. Um, and we will hopefully be in touch and, and, um, you know, again, thank you. And it was such a wonderful documentary and we're so happy that you could come here for this event tonight. Thank you. Thank Have you for having me. Sure thing.